Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Not That Simple from the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation. Today we're going to look at the future of work and rather whether we could be looking at a world without work and what that could mean for all of us, how we should prepare. Our guest is Dr. Daniel Suskind, a research professor in economics at King's College London and a senior research associate at the Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford University. He's the author of A World Without Work, described by the New York Times as required reading for any potential presidential candidate thinking about the economy of the future. Previously, he worked in various roles in the British government, in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, in the Policy Unit, in 10 Downing Street, and in the Cabinet Office as well. So Daniel today is going to explain what a future without work, work could look like, or what is the future of work. Daniel, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and, and naturally, I want to kick off by asking you about the meaning of the title of your most recent book, which is A World Without Work. Are we really looking at a world without work or is it a, wor a world with a different kind of work? Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, today. I mean, every day we hear stories of systems and machines that are taking on tasks that until recently we thought only human beings alone could ever do. Making medical diagnoses and driving cars, drafting legal contracts and designing buildings, uh, composing music and writing news reports. You know, what does all of this mean for the vast majority of us for whom our job is our main, if not our only source of income? Um, I, I wrote A World Without Work because I don't think we're taking seriously enough mm. the threat of a world where there's not enough work for people to do because of the sorts of technological changes that are taking place. But just to say, I mean, anybody who picks up the book expecting an account of some dramatic big technological bang after which lots of people wake up and find themselves without work, they're going to be pretty disappointed because that's unlikely to happen. And it's not what I write about. You know, work is going to remain for some time to come. What I worry about is a more gradual problem, that as we move through the 21st century, more and more people are going to find themselves unable to make the sorts of economic contributions to society that they might have hoped or expected to make in the 20th century. So it's a less sort of cinematic, a less dramatic picture of a world without work. But nevertheless, I don't think any less consequential for those who are caught up in it. This is a fascinating topic, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing it with you. Um, before we, we dive deeper, uh, try to break it down to, to our audience of why this is quite a, a, a complicated topic to, yeah. to explore or, or to explain, because technological advances are, are changing all the time, and, and the, 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 the speed at which transitions happen is also quite difficult to predict, right? That's right. I mean, and I think one of the reasons, one of the main reasons it's so confusing and um, disorientating is the fact that you know, really, ever since modern economic growth began 300 years ago, people have been worrying about the technologies of their time taking on the work that they do. The sorts of conversations we're having today, it's not a particularly new conversation. People have been having it for centuries. And so the question is, well, is this time really different? Um, what makes this time different? And I think that's one of the main reasons that this is quite so difficult to get to grips with, because there's a feeling that people have worried in the past and turned out to be wrong. Why do we need to worry today? I think the short answer to that question, just to cut through everything, is that our machines are becoming increasingly capable, our systems and machines. They are, to put it bluntly, taking on tasks and activities, again, that until recently, we thought only human beings alone could ever do. The longer answer, is that when you look at the different ways that technological progress might have helped displace workers in the past, uh, might have increased demand for their work elsewhere in the economy, there are, I think, reasons to think that those helpful forces might be weaker in the future than they were in the past. But that, I think, is the main reason that people mm. find, it, find it difficult, just that this has happened before. Why is, why is this time different? And I do think it is. Now, Daniel, you've said that when you look at the future and the future of work, it's not so much just the fact of there being 
volume of work available or not, but it's the kind of work that's available, right? And I wanted to explore that because there may be work that is there to do, but can't be done because you don't have the skills or you're not in the right place yeah. or you don't have the right profile, right? So, so can you elaborate on that? That's right. I mean, there are two ways in which people might find themselves disrupted by technological change I mean, in, in, in the world of work. One is where there just simply isn't enough work to be done full stop, mm. um, where there's a sort of what we might call a structural technological unemployment. There just aren't enough jobs to go around. But there's a different problem, and this is in fact the one I think we face today, at least from a technological point of view, which is that there are jobs for people to do, but as you just hinted at, there are reasons why people aren't able to take up those jobs. One of those reasons is because people don't have the right skills mm. and the right capabilities. Um, and it's exactly as you said, and, and that tends to take up a lot of our time and attention. We ask, well, how can we give people the skills and capabilities to do these new jobs? And that's certainly a big part of it. But there are other reasons that people can't do the available work. One is that people just might not live in the same place that work is being created. Um, and, and, and that is you know, really significant and really important. And, and that's what I call a place mismatch. And then there's also what I call an identity mismatch, where people have a particular conception of who they are uh, and they're willing to stay out of work in order to protect that identity. So just to give you an example of that, think of adult men in the United States, displaced from manufacturing roles by new technologies. Now, there are some people who would say that these men would rather not work at all than take up, and it's an unfortunate term, but take up so-called pink collar work. And it's a term designed to capture the fact that many of the jobs that are hardest to automate, and indeed many of the jobs in which we could anticipate lots of job growth in the future, they're disproportionately done by women. So more than 85% of preschool and kindergarten teachers, mm. of nurses, of social workers in the United States are women. So I think we've got to be alive to all these different types of mismatches, all these different reasons that people might not be able to do the work that, that uh, technological progress is creating. Um, but as I said, they might not be able to do it. Mm. I wanted to also get your take on, on the way that we look at work, because obviously there's job and there's career, mm. right? And, and there's feeling that you're working to make, make ends meet or, mm. or you're ambitious and you're following a career path. And yeah. talk to us about the way in which that may, may change as well in, in, in the future. Yeah, well, I, I think it's very important. Um, and I think it's a neglected relationship. You know, typically, and I speak on behalf of economists here, when we think about work, we tend to think about it from an economic point of view as a source of income, uh, as a form of wage. And clearly, you know, it, it is that and it's very important. But there's many people who say, well, look, work isn't just a source of income and wage, it's also a source of meaning and purpose as well. Uh, and so if that's right, if work isn't just about what you earn, but it's also about a sense of identity and purpose, then the challenge of a world with less work, as we were describing for, before, isn't just an economic challenge um, of what we do if technological progress hollows out the labor market and leaves you know, some people without work, but it's also a sort of non-economic challenge. How do we provide people with meaning and purpose uh, if this technological progress hollows out that sense of meaning and purpose too? So I think one of the consequences of automation and one of the consequences of this um, discussion and debate about the likely impact of technology in the labor market is that it's making us more uh, alive, more aware of these non-economic dimensions of work as well. There's so many questions that, that came to my mind whilst you were speaking, but since yeah. you did touch on, on technology, I wanted, I wanted to, to look at the role of technology companies um, and, and, and the... The, the, the size at which the, the Amazons and the Googles and the Apples and et cetera uh, uh, of, of these companies and, and what that has meant as well to the type of work that, that they are providing or the type of work that they are also uh, uh, not providing because there's enough technology there to, to make those jobs automated. So what have you seen there and how do you see the, 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 the job market uh, evolve in, in, in when you talk about these large multinational companies? 
Yeah. And what, and what you're hinting at there, I think, is something very important, which is that there's something slightly misleading about that term technological unemployment, because mm. it makes it seem like the only way the world of work adjusts or changes as technological progress takes place, that the only way it changes is through the number of jobs that have to be done. Um, but that clearly isn't the only way, the only margin on which labour markets adjust. Not only the number of jobs, but the nature of those jobs as well. Uh, and, and we're seeing changes in lots of different directions here, not just in the wages that jobs are paid, but also in other qualities of jobs as well. Uh, their security, their flexibility, uh, their status, you know, the, the, the rise of the so-called gig economy, which is underpinned by mm. many of the large economy, uh, large companies that you're talking about. You know, the concerns there are far less concerns about the number of jobs and they're far more about the concerns people have about the nature of the jobs that are being made available. So again, I think this is another important uh, bit of color, bit of detail that's required when we're thinking about the impact of technology on work, not just to think about it in terms of the number of jobs and the level of unemployment, but also the nature of those jobs and the quality of the workplace. It's interesting how you use the word disorientated in the beginning when, when people mm -hmm. look at what they can expect in the future. and. I mean, I have, I have a two-year-old daughter now, and I have no yeah. idea what she's going to want to become in the future, but certainly the prospect is completely different to mine 40 years ago. When you look at, at, at the future generations and the way that they are able to adapt to uh, 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 new uh, uh, variables and, and factors, what do you think are the professions of, of the future for uh, uh, the, the youth of today and how, how different those possibilities were for us, whether they were different because th there's more possibilities now, less, or they're just different? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, as, as you'll know, one of the other books that I've uh, written was uh, called The Future of the Professions. I wrote yeah. it back in 2015 and it, and it looked particularly at the future of white collar work. Uh, the word professions has a particular connotation uh, in in uh, the UK, at least, and it, it tends to be associated with lawyers and doctors and teachers and accountants and architects and consultants and so on. Um, and I suppose the point here, and, and you sort of referenced it a little in your question there, is that the problems that these professions solve, whether it's legal problems or medical problems or accountancy problems or whatever they might be, those things aren't going away. Indeed, there's going to be huge demand for those sorts of problems to be solved in the future. But what technology is allowing us to do is it's allowing us to solve those problems in very different ways. And so I suppose my, you know, what, what, what I would say to, I mean, I wouldn't say it to your two and a half year old daughter, but <laughs> what, what, no. what I would say to, you know, uh, a, a young person is that if you go into the professions in particular, because you use that word there, if you go into the professions in particular, because you want to be the sort of doctor or lawyer or teacher that your parents or grandparents were, you're going to be disappointed. Mm. You know, if you go into the law because you've watched Suits and you think that's what it means to be a lawyer, or you've, you know, you go into medicine because you've watched House and you quite like the look of the, <laughs> you know, the, the hospital, you're going to be disappointed because what technology is doing is it's transforming the ways that we solve legal problems, medical problems, whatever it might be. And the skills and capabilities required to do that look very different from the sorts of things that our parents and grandparents are trained to do. The challenge though is that actually if you look at, um, and this is uh, you know, perhaps for another conversation, but if you look at what we're doing in terms of training and preparing people for the professions, often mm. we are still training people to be 20th century rather than 21st century mm. uh, uh, professionals. Yeah, I mean, how education is changing or isn't changing in order to adapt fast enough to the economy of the future is, you're right, mm. it is a conversation probably for, for another time because it, it is very pertinent, but we wouldn't have uh, the ability to go into it now. But I, I did want to get your, your opinion, of course, on and your book. Your book uh, uh, came out uh, uh, pre-pandemic or was written pre-pandemic. Yeah. How much has the pandemic accelerated uh, uh, the, the, the role of technology in, in, in the, the, the future professions or the future way in which people work remotely? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I think it's really important to reflect on this. The, the book, A World Without Work, originally came out in January 2020. Uh, and then two months later, of course, the pandemic yeah. really 
got underway. Uh, and there's there's lots we can say about the interaction between technology and the pandemic. Uh, you know, the pandemic, I think, has been the largest shock to the labor market in, in living mm. history. Mm. Um, there's lots to say about it, but I think the one you hinted at there is is the most significant, which is that on balance, the pandemic probably need, means we need to take the sorts of technological challenge those challenges that I've been describing more seriously uh, than we might have done before the pandemic began. And, and very quickly, I think there's three reasons for this. One is that you know, un the unfortunate consequence of the pandemic around the world from an economic point of view has been recessions. And we've mm -hmm. seen recessions all over the place. And, and one of the, I think, surprising features of recessions is that when economies turn down, when they get worse, that's often the moment that automation picks up uh, that's what we've seen time and again in labor markets around the world. And so I think that's one reason. You know, another is, just to put it bluntly, the pandemic created a new incentive to automate the work that people do, you know, particularly those involved in interpersonal tasks, perhaps in services and retail and hospitality, or those involved in using manual dexterity in poorly ventilated indoor spaces like mm. a factory or a warehouse. There was a new, very strong incentive to replace those people with machines. Uh, machine cannot catch the virus and fall ill. It wasn't going to have to take time off work to protect co-workers or customers. At the margin, there was a new incentive uh, to replace people with machines. And lots of investments were made in that sort of direction over the last few years, factory automation, retail automation, and so on. And I think we should be alive to some of those sorts of technologies coming online in the months to come. Just very quickly, though, a final reason that I think the pandemic might accelerate some of these technological trends is with respect to a cultural shift that I wonder might have taken place um, concerning technology. You know, what, one way to think about the pandemic is that all of us were involved in a sort of massive, unplanned, unwanted, but entirely inescapable pilot scheme in the use of technology in the workplace. You know, overnight telemedicine, virtual courts, online education, remote working, the sort of conversation we're having today, you know, all of this stuff just became mm -hmm. the norm. Now, why do I say this? Well, because as with any technological experiment, there's been some spectacular failures. And I think, you know, you and I and everyone watching this can point to areas of our lives where technology let us down over the last couple of years. Um, but on balance, I think we'd probably all agree that it's been a relative success, this experiment, that we've been impressed and surprised at how we can use technology to work in very different ways, more efficiently and perhaps more effectively than in the past. And this matters because the barriers to automation are often cultural. It's about what we feel comfortable, we feel happy automating, as well as the technical questions of what's possible to automate or the economic questions about what's profitable to automate. It's also cultural. Do we feel comfortable using technology in the workplace in this particular way? And I wonder, to the extent that one of the things that got in the way of using technology in the past, and remote work is a great example of this, might have been some technological conservatism, some bias towards the technological status quo. Now, I wonder if one of the consequences of the pandemic is just going to be to soften some of that conservatism, soften some of that technological status quo bias. And, you know, just to see this bluntly, any particular act of automation in the next couple of years, it's just going to seem far less radical to us mm. than it would have seemed if we yeah. hadn't been through this big technological experiment over the last few years. So those are a few reasons why I think the pandemic on balance yeah. means uh, we need to be taking these technological challenges more seriously now than we might have done before the pandemic began. Uh, uh, and a side quick question for you, because you mentioned mm. the cultural uh, uh, issues that, 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 could, that could affect the way in which people accept automation mm. or not. It, it's interesting because uh, uh, in, in Portugal, for example, the way in which people see an interaction with a bank is completely different than in the UK, where I lived for seven years, or in the US, where I lived for nine years. And you know, here, traditionally, they still expect a, a personal interaction, a conversation, yeah. et cetera. Do you notice within your experience in different areas of the world and the different cultural expectations people have that they may adapt quicker or slower to, to automation and uh, to, to a different kind of, of, of profession or role 
in whatever work they're doing. Yeah. You get huge amounts of variation across the professions, you know, across different uh, different professions in different areas of the labor market, across different jurisdictions within a country, uh, across different countries. Huge variety. It's very hard to generalize. You do see, though, some quite interesting uh, developments in response to particular incentives in places. So somewhere like Japan, for instance, um, very high proportion of elderly people relative to young people, mm. uh, historical antipathy towards mm. migrant workers. Mm. As a result, in the care sector, in, in the nursing sector, big shortage of workers. Uh, with typically yeah, big demand from the elderly population, limited supply because of this his historical antipathy towards migrant labor. And as a result, that's created a very strong incentive to explore the use of robotics uh, in healthcare and in okay. nursing. Um, and so you do see uh, in some parts of the world those kind of interesting incentives sort of shoving, pushing, encouraging the use of technology in a particular direction. And you don't see it in other places. Mm. Now, I wanted to get your take on the four-day four, uh, four day work week. Uh, it's been discussed, increasingly discussed, I would say, yeah. 2022 more than I, I had definitely seen it in the in the. Uh, uh, media agenda anyway. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, fascinating and provocative, but to be a bit boring, I don't I don't think it's necessarily the, the, the challenge that we've got to be thinking about at the moment. Uh, I put it in the same bucket as something like uh, a universal basic income. I think they're interesting and provocative questions for thinking about, you know, what we might do in a future where we have extraordinary abundance, material abundance and abundance of leisure time. And the question is, well, how do we share it all out? For now, I think the challenge is closer to the one that we were talking about earlier, which is, well, there's all this work to be done. How do we get people to do that work? Uh, whether it's to do with skills, whether it's to do with people living in the right places, or whether it's to do with these issues of identity. Um, those, I think, are the really pressing challenges. In a sense, these debates about length of the working week, basic incomes and so on, they are solutions and, and problems, which I think, you know, as we look further into the 21st century, do start to rear their heads and are worth thinking about for that reason. But they're not really the contemporary challenges. Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously, since since you, you do live in the UK and, and we yeah. have had Brexit recently, I have to ask you as well about the increase in... Uh, um, a limitation of, of, of work opportunities for immigrants in, in various countries, whether that be in the US, which traditionally has always been difficult to grant visas. In the UK, I know personally a lot of qualified professionals that five years ago would get a job from today until tomorrow in the UK, but now they can't because of visas. So when you look at the, at the future of work and the way it could look as far as the labor market being more restrictive from yeah. an authorization perspective. Have you have you looked at any any possible threats uh, because of this tendency for certain countries to protect their own population, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you know if we look at it from the big picture, uh, if we think about the longer term, what are the consequences from a technological point of view of, of clamping down on 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 immigration on, on migrants I, just, I i think it's sort of catastrophic um you know what drives economic growth and prosperity in the medium run it's ideas it's new ideas mm. about how we can use our finite resources more mm. effectively and more efficiently where do those ideas come from they come from human beings bumping into one another and being imaginative and creative i mean if you look at the US technology sector, for instance, it's just a, a, a classic example of this. The, the proportion of companies in Silicon Valley started by, um, you know, the proportion of unicorns started by migrants, incredibly high. The proportion of homes in Silicon Valley where at home a, a language other than English is spoken, I think it's more than half. You now you see when it comes to the creation of, you know, the discovery of new ideas, and innovation and driving economies forward, uh, having you know, migrants are a key part of that. And so, from that point of view, and, and it's a, it's what something I'm, I'm writing and thinking about at the moment in, in my in my latest research. Uh, I think it's um, 
it's really it's it's really not good at all. There's a lot more to be said about migration, but 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 that, that I think is the the observation that I would make given the work I'm doing at the moment. As we look at wrapping up our conversation, I wanted to really delve into your experience and expertise as far as what what would you advise the the, the young people of today, the the the, the young people who are finishing their, their secondary education or their university studies in order to become as valuable as possible for their careers and their jobs in, in the future. What, 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 what insight can you, can you give them? Yeah. I mean, very crudely, I'd say there are two strategies. Either you want to become the sort of person who competes with these systems and machines, who can do the sorts of things they cannot do, uh, and in spite of all the technological things we've been talking about, the developments we've been talking about today, you know, clearly there are large areas of human activity that lie beyond the reach of even the most capable technologies. Certain types of tasks that require creativity or problem solving, certain tasks that require interpersonal skills or communication. You know, there are many areas of human life that sit beyond the reach of even the most capable technologies. The second strategy is to instead become the sort of person who can build these systems and machines, who can you know, design and put them to use, understand how they work. Those, I think, are the two basic strategies. You either compete or you build. Mm. It might sound relatively basic, relatively anodyne, relatively straightforward, but if you look at what we're actually doing in practice, if you look at the sorts of skills and capabilities that we're actually providing people with, well, often we're doing neither of those things. Often we are giving people exactly the sorts of routine yeah, the capabilities to do precisely the sorts of routine activities uh, that these technologies are already very good at doing. And I think this is a big mistake. Um, but I also think, though, it's important not to be too prescriptive to you know, the next generation of workers about what skills and capabilities are going to be valuable and important. Now, as, as we've said, there's a huge amount of uncertainty about what lies ahead, about what jobs have to be done, and about what skills and capabilities will be most valuable and important. And I suppose the best response from all of us to that uncertainty is flexibility, hmm. you know, an open-mindedness, a willingness to retrain and reskill later in life with the same intensity and seriousness that people might be engaging with education at the start of their life. You know, I think there's a, a cultural presumption, and I feel comfortable saying this uh, about Portugal as I do about the UK and elsewhere, that education is the sort of thing you do at the start of your life. That's when you do it. That's when you put the time and the effort and the money. And, you know, once it's done, you don't really have to worry about it again. Uh, and I think that's a big mistake. Mm. We need to be looking at how we can support people to retrain and reskill throughout their lives with the same intensity at the start of their lives. I think we're starting to get a sense of what that means. People talk about lifelong learning, for instance. But mm -hmm. again, if you look at the, the resources that people put into that, either personal resources or resources from the government, it just, it just pales in comparison to what we do with people at the start of their lives. So I'd say just, just in short, think about those two strategies, compete and build, avoid routine stuff. Uh, and then secondly, an open mind and just a flexibility, a recognition that the sorts of things you're learning to do today as you start out on your journey into the world of work might not be the sorts of things that you do in say, you know, maybe not even a decade, but five, five years to come. But that's really interesting because, for example, I've worked in the media for 25 years, and if I mm. look at what the newsroom of a, a, a TV channel looked at at the beginning of my career and what it looks mm. like now, it's completely different. And, and you have got to be able to reinvent yourself and to learn throughout the process in order to, to remain relevant. Now, um, we're going to finish this show as we do with, with uh, all of our guests, which is with a series of quick-fire questions. And uh, what I'd like is a one-sentence uh, sure. answer on, on these, even though I know that, that they obviously could take a lot longer. But uh, uh, and this is obviously taking into account your, your lifelong work and experience. What is one personality trait a good leader could really benefit from having, in your view? I think focusing on outcomes. What am I trying to achieve? and being agnostic, open-minded hmm. about how those outcomes might be achieved. Now, one way to think about technology, again, is that it's transforming the way that we solve problems in society. And if you're too focused on inherited ways of solving problems and not focused enough on what you're actually trying to achieve, 
uh, then you miss some great opportunities to, to use technology to do things very differently. What is the biggest challenge that humanity faces today? I think it's, and, and, and this sound, might sound like I'm doing an act of self-promotion, but I think it's true. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's the focus of my, my new book, which is on economic growth, which is how do we balance the promise of economic growth, the extraordinary material prosperity it brings and all the correlated uh, benefits associated with it, with the existential challenges that it creates. Uh, whether it's climate change, whether yeah. it's inequality, whether it's globalization. Yeah. It seems to me a lot of the problems that we face are, are, are form part of this balancing act between the promise and the price of growth. And, and that's what I'm writing about at the moment. Okay, if you could change one thing in the world today by, by magic, what, what, what would that be? If you can change one thing today? One thing. I think a lot of the, the problems that I look at and spend my time thinking about are global in nature, which creates these problems of international cooperation and coordination. Mm. And if I could click my fingers and encourage, you know, political and business leaders to step out of the particular interests and concerns that mm. they have in a particular country or business and instead take the sort of that, the, the global perspective, that would be immensely useful. Finally and quickly, what's the most important learning of your life and career so far? The one thing. Great question to finish on. Um, I think given I spend my time in the world of ideas and thinking about ideas, and given I spend a lot of time sitting by myself writing and researching them, I think you know, spending time with ideas and issues that you feel um, particularly passionate or strongly about is very important. Um, Yeah. yeah, you said it. Daniel Suskin, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, discuss the future of work, a world without work. That's the title of your most recent book as well. Uh, continued success and, uh, and, and uh, good luck with all your projects. And we look uh, forward to uh, finding out what your next uh, book will look like and when it's uh, going to be published. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be part of this. Pleasure, Daniel. Um, and over the last half an hour or so, we really had an opportunity to get plenty of insight and experience from Daniel on what the future of work looks like and what we can do in order to be prepared for it. It's been another episode of It's Not That Simple from the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation. See you again soon.